Would you be free from your burden of sin? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Would you or evil a victory win? There's wonderful power in the blood. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power, power, wonder-working power in the precious blood of the Lamb. Would you be free from your passion and pride? There's power in the blood power in the blood come for a cleansing to calvary stein there's wonderful power in the blood there is power power wonder working power in the blood of the lamb there is power power wonder working power in the precious blood of the lamb would you be wider, much wider than snow? There's power in the blood, power in the blood. Sin stains are lost in its life-giving flow. There's wonderful power in the blood. There's power, power, wonder-working power in the blood of the Lamb. There is power. precious blood of the lamb would you do service to jesus your king there's power in the blood power in the blood would you live daily his praises to sing there's wonderful power in the blood there is power power wonder working power in the blood of the lamb there is power, power, wonder-working power In the precious blood of the Lamb In the precious blood of the Lamb There is love that came for us, humble to a sinner's cross. You broke my shame and sinfulness. You rose again, victorious. Faithfulness, none can. Through the storm and through the fire, there is truth that sets me free. Jesus Christ, who lives in me, you are stronger. No beginning and no end. You're my hope and my defense. You came to see and save the lost. You paid it all upon the cross. You are stronger. You are strong. higher be lifted higher so let your name 
It is written, Christ is risen, Jesus, you are Lord of all. Good morning. Um, so we're going to read Psalm 19 today, and I am reading from the NIV version. For the director of music, a psalm of David. The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. Day after day, they pour forth speech. Their voice goes out into all the earth. Their words to the ends of the world. In the heaven, he has pitched a tent for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming forth from his pavilion. Like a champion rushing, oh, rejoicing to run his course. It rises at one end of the heavens and makes its circuit to the other. Nothing is hidden from its heat. The law of the Lord is perfect, reviving the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The ordinance of the Lord are sure and altogether righteous. They are more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the comb. By them is your servant warned. In keeping them, there is great reward. Who can discern his errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servant also from willful sins. May they not rule over me. Then I will be blameless, innocent of great transgressions. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. O oh Lord, my rock and my redeemer. The word of the Lord. People have seen the northern lights. The heavens declare the glory of God. We are very fortunate where we live, and if you go further north, it's even more astounding to see the heavens dance with multiple colors. And in heaven, there's more colors. That's exciting. So let's pray together. Lord, we thank you that you love us. We thank you for your death and for your resurrection that we celebrated last week. We thank you that you have gone to heaven to intercede for us. We thank you that you sent your Holy Spirit to comfort and lead us and to talk to us and to show us the direction we should go in life. And Lord, we thank you that you have answered the problems that we have with intimacy with you and that you are the one that leads and guides in all things. We thank you that you care about us individually. We thank, we're thankful that you love us. We ask God that you would Bless Manor Gospel Church this week. And uh, we thank you for the, the heritage of that church and for the, the people that attend there. Pray for our, <clears throat> our MP, Damon Kirk, that you would strengthen him in, as they make decisions in Ottawa and that you'd help him to stand up for righteousness. And God, we pray for the Christians in Ukraine and Russia that are suffering greatly. We ask that you'd comfort them, open their eyes, and we pray, God, too, that you would open the eyes of many people that don't believe in you to see that you are the answer to their needs. Pray for Ellis Melnichuk, Lord, as she's recovering from uh, a broken hip, and for Jay Sherlaw, that you'll intervene and strengthen him and repair his kidneys. For Chip Welton, that you'd bless him as he's had surgery. And God, we ask that you would bless our pastor and his wife, and especially Connie, as she's uh, struggling with, with a little bit of uh, <clears throat> sickness. 
And we pray, God, for Alan Bloom as he's in the hospital. We thank you for him, and we ask that you'd strengthen and, and encourage him. We pray for the sick in our church, known and unknown, for those that are, are, uh, have symptoms of sickness, that you would open their eyes to trust in you. We pray for the Cowie family and for encouragement in their loss. We pray for our missionaries, the chapels. She encourage them as they are involved in ministry that from a distance and how COVID has, has caused uh, disruption. Pray for all of our missionaries, God, that have struggled with uh, COVID and no meetings and not being able to contact people. So God, we ask that you encourage Dennis today as he speaks to us from what God has laid on his heart. Thank you for all you've done for us. In your name we pray, amen. As I've grown older, I've often appreciated <clears throat> the humor that comes very often with age. A few weeks ago, <clears throat> I was uh, uh, told a story that I want to share with you. It really has nothing to do with the message, but it's good. <laughs> These two ladies who hadn't seen each other in 40 years, but had kept contact, were having tea together. And uh, the first lady said, well, you know, during this time, I've been married twice. My first electrician was an electrician, and my now husband is a construction worker. The other lady said, well, I've been married four times. The first time was to a very wealthy man. He was a financier. Second time was to an actor. The third time was to a pastor. And now I'm married to an undertaker. And the lady says, oh, I see, one for the money, two for the show, three to get ready, and four to go. <clears throat> it falls to my duty to deliver the homily in the absence of our pastor today. And I would like you to turn to the 119th Psalm. <clears throat> We're going to look at the first eight verses. But first, a little bit of background. This psalm is an acrostic. There are 22 letters in the Hebrew alphabet. We, of course, are most familiar with Alpha and Omega, which <clears throat> Jesus said, <clears throat> I'm wondering if, uh, if an usher could bring me some water, please. And uh, these stanzas, which are also 22 stanzas of eight verses each, Start with the letter of the alphabet as it goes through the song. This was very easy for people to memorize because of that acrostic. Commentators agree that the psalmist was going through a very distressful uh, and tension-filled time in his life. They also state that this was probably due to the... Uh, <clears throat> being surrounded by wickedness and often sought out by an arrogant leader who was Saul. He was disgraced. He was removed from the king's table and became an outlaw, a traitor that was being sought. And where does he turn? This psalm says that he turns to the word of God. Thank you. I guess I shouldn't have probably sang so heartily along with everybody. That was so good, though. So now we turn our attention to the first eight verses, Psalm 119. Blessed are those whose ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord. Blessed are those who keep his statutes and seek him with all their heart. They do no wrong, but follow his ways. You have laid down precepts that are to be fully obeyed. Oh, that my ways were steadfast in obeying your decrees. Then I would be, not be put to shame when I consider all your commands. I will praise you with an upright heart as I learn your righteous laws. I will obey your decrees. Do not utterly forsake me. 
The first thing we want to do is we want to look at these sacred components here in the scripture. Uh, the first one is law. And we find, and someone has taken time to do this, we find that in this psalm, law is mentioned 25 times. It has a very broad meaning. It means all of God's word that applies to the instruction for life and our actions. But there's a narrower meaning too. And that is a direct reference to the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. Now, Paul summarized the importance of the law in the book of Romans and chapter 3 and verses 19 and 20. Listen to these words. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be silenced and the whole world held accountable to God. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sins. Law, very necessary, teaches us our, what we do wrong and inspires us to do what is right. The second one is testimonies. This is mentioned 24 times in the scriptures. And these are those who witness to God's character, his power, his works. And the Bible is full of stories uh, that give testimony of these things. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, Moses, David, Job, Ruth, Esther, in the Gospels, and in the book of Acts. We have many testimonies of God's power and faithfulness to us. The third one is precepts. And this is mentioned 21 times in this psalm. These are rules for conduct, for living. They are a revelation of God's authority as he gives us these rules. They are his religious principles. And we have many examples of these in the scripture. Proverbs, Psalms, uh, we have the prison epistles in the New Testament. The fourth one is statutes, mentioned 19 times in this psalm. Uh, these are the social regulations, the loyalty to the terms of the covenant that God made with the nation Israel. And they always require an appropriate response, a response that is expected of submission and loyalty and love to our God. Good example of this is Deuteronomy chapter 6, where we read the words that encourage parents to teach their children, to put the words of God up on the wall and the doorposts of the house, etc. The fifth one is the commandments. Um, this is mentioned 22 times. The most common example, of course, is the Ten Commandments. A commandment is a mandate for people to follow the will of God. Now, laws are just words on a piece of paper until they receive some kind of obligation or authority. And that's where commands come in. And that is what God has done in his word. These commands are interchangeable between law and, and, uh, uh, and, st uh, and commandments. They're almost simultaneously used in this song. The sixth one is judgments. That's in verse 7. Mentioned 23 times in this song. A decision has been handed down. It is the right one. It never changes because it is delivered by a supreme judge, God himself. It is both authoritative and liberating. Uh, one day I was out on the town uh, going to the, uh, we even have them here where we have the shopping that goes till midnight, the midnight madness. And I had on a gray coat and I had on a fur hat and I came uh, to walk into the home hardware. And there were two young guys coming out and they must have thought I was the police because they just pulled up short and they looked at me and I knew they were probably guilty of something, maybe uh, shoplifting. But that is what happens to people who disobey the law. And when they see an authority, then, of course, they become quite concerned. So in that 
idea, we see that the law or the uh, judgments are authentic, but they're also liberating. Because if you don't disobey the law, you don't feel like that. The seventh one is the decrees, mentioned 21 times in this song. And they give us order for our lives. They are edicts. They are decrees that announce a rule or a regulation. The action is to be taken. Do you know we still use decrees today? If you sit on town council, often there is a decree that is made from our council to our town that this is going to be the week that we acknowledge victims. Or this is going to be National Reading Week. Or this is mental health week. So we see that these decrees are still used today. Now let us take a step back and just look at that list. Does that mean that when I read God's word, that I should try and figure out which one of these things that fit into which category? No, it doesn't. Because it's all God's word. And it came from him. We have support in the New Testament for this, and it's found in uh, Paul's words to Timothy, and let me just read those few verses to you. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3 in verses 16 and 17, all scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. We don't have to be worried about categories because it's all God's word. It is written for our benefit. It is a reliable guide for living. It enlightens our minds and our understanding. And it is a great comfort in sorrow and distress. Let's go now to what this psalm says by definition describing what God's word is. Uh, there's a great deal in the Word of God, particularly in this psalm, that defines what the Bible is. But I think we need to keep quite narrow and stick to these eight verses. Plus, I'll use a few verses from the scripture that was read. Verse 1 says it's the law. And it's described as the law. God's governing rules, and it is our authority for all of mankind. In verse 4... It says that God's word is ordained. Now there's two concepts that can be understood in regards to ordained. It is a decree to be acted upon. Uh, or it could be an order that is to be followed. Uh, we have another use of the word ordained in our society where we have uh, pastors who uh, are ordained for ministry, etc. But this is not that application. It is actually talking about God's word. In verse 7, it talks about righteousness. What is right? What is proper? Uh, decisions that we make with our moral behavior. What we think. What we say. What we do. The word of God is righteous. Now from Psalm 19, which is read to us so well. Verse 7 says that God's word is perfect. It is excellent. It is finished. It is absolute. It is impeccable, infallible. It is sure. Now there's a good verse, a good word, because it is certain. It is reliable. It is definite. Verse 8 says that God's word is right. It is correct. It is proper. It is absolute. And then it says it endures forever. And here I want to take just a little bit of a rabbit trail. Because there's two things in the word of God that are, says that are eternal. The first is the word of God itself. Isaiah chapter 40 and verse 8 says this. The grass, grass withers. The flowers fade. But the word of our God stands forever. Amen. And that was also repeated in 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 25, right from that same text. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3 and verse 11, it gives us the other thing that is eternal. 
and that is the soul of man. He, God says he has also set eternity in their hearts. Now, if you go to John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29, it will tell you there very clearly that the eternal destiny of either heaven or hell is a choice that we need to make. But the soul lives forever. Two things that are eternal. The word of God, soul of man. Now, coming back, verse 8 says of chapter 19, it teaches us the fear of God. In chapter 9, it says that this word is true, it is correct, it is constant, it is genuine, it is sincere. When the truckers were in Ottawa, I was trying to find out something in regards to what is true here. And it came about like this. I watched CBC, I watched CTV, and that was a little different. And I watched Global, and it was different again. I thought, well, let's switch to the Fox Network. And it was totally different again. And then I went to BBC and I, I watched what they had to say and it was different again. And the question came to me, where is the truth in all of this? I had trouble discerning truth. Well, we don't find that when we come to the word of God. It is to be our source of truth. It is righteous, we've already talked about that, and it is to be desired. In fact, verse 10 says, it is to be desired more than gold. In the Old West, I have many books on the Old West. I'm intrigued by that time period. And on our vacations, we've been to places like Tombstone, etc. But there was the Pony Express. It only lasted 18 months. And the main reason it come to an end be, was because of the telegraph. But we learned that uh, it was about 1,900 miles long. It stretched from St. So Joseph, Missouri to Sacramento, California. It took 10 days and 40 men to ride 50 miles a day on 500 of the best horses that could be found. The saddles were very small. No rifle was carried. The horses had small shoes or none at all. The mail pouches were flat and letters were written on thin paper and postage was $5 an ounce, which was a lot of money at that time. And yet, history says that each of them carried a Bible. They were given this Bible when they were given the assignment by their uh, owner, Mr. Russell. And uh, they took it with them, despite all of the weight precautions. He was concerned for the spiritual benefit of his writers. This book is to be treasured. It has been baked into bread, so that it would be protected from authorities finding it. It's been hidden in walls. It's been hidden underground. It's been bound in waterproof bags and placed in wells. It is the best published book that exists in our world. It is translated into many languages. It is smuggled to believers who have no Bible. Attempts have been made to burn and to destroy it. God's word is our reliable source of truth. Now let's talk about the benefits of God's word. In verse 1 of these eight verses, we read that God's blessing rests on those who follow the teaching of his word. So what are these blessings? We go back into Psalm 19, and we start with verse 7, and in verse 8, and it tells us what these blessings are. First of all, it says, it restores the soul. I have a friend who's passed away now. His name was Fred. He was known as the town alcoholic and drug addict. And yet, in his darkest moment, when he was right at the bottom, someone had given him a Bible along the way. And he had opened that Bible and he began to read. And that night, he said he dedicated his life to God. Now, God changed him. He never had one withdrawal symptom at all. 
That was a miracle. However, he did share with me that he struggled every day with the temptations to return to drugs and to alcohol. But he was so thankful when I baptized him. He said, I am so thankful that God gave me a chance to know him before I had to go and see him. What a testimony. He restores the soul. The word of God does that. In verse 8, it says, it rejoices the heart. Many times we're down and we're depressed and we, we don't know the, how to deal with the feeling that we have. And we can open the word of God. And Psalms is really good for this. And we can read about how that person was feeling and we can relate to that. And we can understand how it does bring joy to the heart. It also says in verse 8 that it enlightens the eye. We need understanding. We need to be able to see the deception that is all around us today. And we need, we need, uh, we need to be able to say the truth or see the truth. So we read that it enlightens our eyes. And then it says it brings us wisdom and discernment. God's word does this. This is how God blesses us with the word. Let me stop there for a moment. If the only time we ever hear the word of God is here in church, we need to add something to our life. There's little books out on the information table called Our Daily Bread. Pick one up. It has a scripture reading and another reading with it that helps us to be able to understand what the scripture is talking about. And so most of them are so fitting for the day, it's just amazing how that works. Maybe you already do that. Well, let me challenge you further. Read through the Bible in one year. You can go to uh, different apps that there are on uh, the internet, and you can download an app that will help you to read through the Bible. Uh, Gordon helped me to do that a few years back, and I use it quite a bit. Or you can purchase a Bible that has some of the Old Testament, some of the New Testament, a psalm and a proverb with it for every day. But be in God's word every day. Find a way. It certainly will bring blessing to your life. Verse 2. It says that it produces diligence in us. You know, one of the biggest problems that we have as God's children is self-discipline. But God's word keeps us on track, keeps us going the right way, points us in the right direction. So we do need to be diligent in reading it and being in it. Verses 3 and 6 tells us that it keeps us from sin. Well, how does that happen? Is there something magic? like carrying it in your saddlebag so that you have protection? No. It keeps us from sin because we have been training our minds as we've been reading God's word. And so when we come to decisions that we need to make, we know what is right and what is wrong because God's word said so. So it keeps us from sinning. It keeps us on the track of doing what is right. Verse 5 says it produces steadfastness. Or maybe another way of saying that is our ways are established. So we can see patterns into our life by simply reading this book. Patterns of righteousness, patterns of discipline. And we can get to that stick to it perseverance because of this book. We just have to be in it. Verse 8, very maybe difficult verse. But as I contemplated this verse, I realized it was really talking about God's mercy, his protection. And so there's a plea here. And the plea is, don't abandon me or forsake me utterly. Now, God's word is a measuring stick. And we can look at our lives and we can... Measure it with what God is saying to us. 
Now, it's, it's not hard to know that we don't measure up all the time. That often we fail. But thankful we are that God gives us his mercy and his grace and he establishes us. Now, as I conclude, I want to just remind you that in Psalm 119 and verse 9, it says that God's word is to be desired more than gold. Here are seven wonders of the word, just to cap what we've been saying. First of all, there's the wonder of its formation. Over an extended years of time, this book has been accumulated using many authors. Yet there is one central message that flows through all of this book, and that is that Jesus Christ, God's Son, came to give us redemption to restore us into a right relationship with God the Father. There's a wonder of unification. There are 66 books, yet only one book. There is the wonder of its age. It's ancient. It comes from a long time ago and over the years has been formulated into a book that we can have. It's, there's the wonder of its popularity. It is the best seller of all time, even yet. There's the wonder of its interest. It is read by people all over the world, different races, different tongues, different nations. There is the wonder of its language. It's written by mere men, and yet it is a literary gem. There's the wonder of its preservation. Many have sought to uh, de uh, destroy it, or at least restrict access to it, yet it continues to exist. I was interested to hear that there are many house churches in China that when they get a Bible, they rip it all apart, and they give part of it to this person, part of it to that person, part of it to this person, and then when they meet the next week, they exchange. So they've had some of the Word of God with them all week. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 20 says, He who gives attention to the word shall find good. Now this book isn't magic, but it is profound. It sets the truth and the standard for us to believe. It is a treasured book. Now if you look on the front of your bulletin, there's a Bible there. What's on top of the Bible? A TV remote. Mm -hmm. How important is God's word to us? There are people who have said, and Pastor alluded to this a week or so ago, that you can read this Bible through at reading speed that you'd use at a pulpit in two weeks. We have 52 weeks in a year. You might say, well, I'm just too busy to do that. Are you really? How important is this book? I believe that as we get closer to the end of time and we see that push by a one world government to have a one world leader, a one world monetary system, a one world religious system, we need this book. It will keep us on the right path. Otherwise, we're going to flounder. We're going to be afraid. But we need to fear God, not men. Be in the book. Make a decision today to change something in your life that will include God's word every day if you haven't been doing that. God bless you. Please stand as we sing the last song together. What a fellowship, what a joy divine, leaning on the everlasting arms. What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms.
everlasting arms leaning oh I'm leaning safe and secure from all alarms leaning oh I'm leaning leaning on the everlasting arms oh how sweet to walk in this pilgrim way leaning on the everlasting arms oh how bright the path grows from day to day leaning on the everlasting arms leaning oh i'm leaning safe and secure from Correction to what I said earlier. Um, Cecil's brother who passed his name is Arthur. And so I just wanted to make that right. And may the Lord bless you and comfort you and your family, Cecil. Thank you, Dennis, for a wonderful word and challenge. And I just want to put out there that if you struggle with reading God's word, I would welcome you to come and see me or Pastor Tom because we have some tools and some encouragement and, and different ways to help you to engage in God's worth through close reading of the scripture. So I just open the door to you for that. Our benediction today comes from 1 Peter 1, 24 and 25. All people are like grass and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Amen. Have a great week. Go in peace.